Hey 242, uh, my name's Dave and I'm one of the pastors here and it's great to be with you. Hey, have you ever had this experience uh, where someone gets the name of our church wrong? Like when they come up to you, they say, do you go to that 24 seven church? Or they call it, you know, 24 two or something like that. It happens to me all the time. Now, since we're the, the numbers church, hey, would you do something with me? And this is kind of strange, I know, but just indulge me here. Wherever you are, whatever campus you're at, would you count with me out loud uh, to 10? Okay, just, just go with me on this, okay? Trust me. Um, ready? Okay, here we go. One to 10, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, come on. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay, all right, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Listen, uh, here's why we did this. Counting hasn't always looked like that. In fact, a millennium ago, much of the world counted like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Completely different. And it was this guy, the great mathematician Fibonacci, who changed forever how we count. Now, while the Roman Empire gave us the Roman numerals, it was Fibonacci who gave us the 10 base notation, what you're used to today. His discovery of a new way to count was necessary for him to solve a math problem. It was a math problem that was presented to him called the problem of rabbit reproduction. And, and this is basically what it was. They, they were basically doing an, a multiplication problem, an, an exponential problem, and they used rabbits, okay? Here's how they presented it to him. If you put a pair of rabbits in a place surrounded by walls, rabbits will do what they do, okay? Uh, how many rabbits can be reproduced from that pair in a year? But Roman numerals, they were a clumsy affair at best, barely allowing one, a, one to add and subtract. In fact, just to multiply or divide, he had to use a Chinese abacus and then translate his results back into Roman numerals. And in his frustration, he came up with what we have today. He began to count like we count now. And with that, Fibonacci changed forever how the world does math and how we count today. So, thanks for being here. Let's pray. Here we, no, I'm just kidding. We're, we're not done. Here's, here's my point. Here's where I'm going with this. When Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is in Acts 1.8. He's looking at the brand new church, this fledgling little group of Christ followers. And he says, the Holy Spirit will come and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's, the, that's where they were. And in all Judea, that's a bigger area. And then Samaria. And then he says, to the utter ends of the earth. Jesus was giving us this mission that the whole world would hear the good news about his resurrection, the good news about Jesus. Now, when he says that, we can do one of two things with it. We can dismiss it as this sort of grandiose vision that Jesus meant to, to give us to inspire us, but, but not actually be achieved. Or we admit that there is something fundamentally wrong in how we're going about trying to solve his mission or solve this math problem that he's given us. And we admit that we need to start counting differently. Let me give you some more math. Before Jesus came on the scene in human history, if you look at the population of the world, there's basically like hundreds of millions of people. It, it, it never really gets to a billion people in world population until it's estimated that the world population reaches one billion people for the first time in like 1804. And, and it was another 123 years before it reached 2 billion people, 1927. And it's estimated now that in the year 2050, that there'll be 9.2 billion people on the earth. 
If you look at the course of world history and world population, you will see that Jesus has given us the problem of rapid reproduction. The problem is we're not doing so well. I mean, here's how we're doing in the United States. In the American church, 80% of churches are in decline. In fact, here's some other statistics. 4,000 churches every year turn the lights out and close the door. Here's another one. 40 years, in the last 40 years, no county in the United States has increased its percentage of Christ followers. Guys, we're not even keeping up with population growth. And if we want to solve the Jesus problem, this, this, this problem or this mission of rapid reproduction, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, we are going to have to find a new kind of math to just keep up with population growth. We will need to plant 8,000 churches every year. And that's why we've said at 242, we've, we've said we want every Christ follower to be sort of a church planter, and I'll explain that in a second, and we want every church to be a church planting church. You know, we count on small group leaders and team leaders to do most of the ministry around here. One of the things I love to say is that volunteers run this place, and, and you do. I mean, you guys make it happen. And when we can multiply a new team or a new group, it's like planting a small little church, like every Christ follower, a church planter. And over time, if we can multiply new teams and groups, well, the next thing you know, we've got the makings of a new campus or a new church. Now, we couldn't have expanded new services or new campuses as quickly as we have over the last few years without Leaders multiplying leaders, teams multiplying teams, and small groups multiplying new groups. For everybody that's been a part of that, man, thank you so much. You've been a part of this Jesus movement. Then I said, uh, every church, a church planting church. What do I mean? That, that's really been the heart behind 242's value of church planting and campusing. That's why we started giving money to church plants even from the very beginning, before we were even self-sustaining as a church, we were setting aside money for new church plants. And it's why we've always had staff involved in new thing. And maybe that's a, a, a new thing that you've never heard of, but basically it was just a group of us friends who committed 15 years ago to plant churches together. And now there are over 2,000 new churches all over the world because of that work. And that, that brings me to the last thing I, I wanna say to you. The need is so great for new churches that if existing churches don't start working together, we can't accomplish the Jesus mission. No one church alone can do it. That's why we host meetings among churches and church planters in Michigan to network together with other like-minded leaders who have said, we don't care who gets the credit. We don't care whether we have control we're not going to get hung up in denominational lines and rules. We're going to work together to do whatever it takes to plant new churches that can reach new people for Jesus. And that was really Jesus' prayer, you know. And Jesus is praying. He's just about to go to the cross, and he's praying, and he, he implores our Heavenly Father. Look at this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that's us, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you're in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So through unity, the world is gonna believe. I have given them the glory that you, have, that you gave me, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete, what is it? Unity then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Hey, let me ask you, how are we doing at that? I mean, look at all the denominations, look at all the arguments, look at, look at all the church splits over the centuries. How are we doing at unity? Guys, you know what I, you know what I tell church leaders? I say, you know, when Jesus comes back, he's not coming back for a harem. 
he's coming back for his bride. That's the metaphor that that's talked about in the, in the New Testament revelation that, that the church is really like the bride of Christ. He's coming back for one church, one unified church. Guys, that's my heart. I don't really care to be famous. I, 242 is not plotting world domination. I just, I just wanna see more churches planted to reach more people for Jesus. And we started meeting with some leaders of some other churches and we started evaluating risks on both sides and opportunities on both sides. And we've just come out on the other side enthusiastically saying that we think we're gonna be better together. Will things change? Yeah, there'll be some things change. Living things grow and growing things change. So there'll be some change. Will it be easy? No. Nothing great is ever easy. But still, I'm asking you, will you join us on this Jesus mission? Will you take your place to serve on a team, to check out a small group, to take your next step in giving, and to pray, and to invite new people to join the mission? Brighton, Ann Arbor, Lansing, Saginaw, Livonia, Taylor, Monroe. We are better together and the best is yet to come. Hey, can we one more time just celebrate what God's doing in our church across all of our campuses? Also, can we celebrate what God is doing in his big C church? So let's celebrate that. Now, if we haven't met, my name is Keith. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at 242. And what I'm going to do with the second half of this message is I'm going to pick up where Dave left off in John chapter 17. So if you've got a Bible or a Bible app and you want to follow along with me there, that's where I'm going to be. And I'm also going to land in Acts chapter 2 and then also in Acts chapter 6. But you know, I was thinking this week as I watched that video, that one of the things I love about that video is that it's some good news. You know, we live in a culture, in a society, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm bombarded by bad news. I mean, if it's not the whole trade war in China, then it's what's going on in Iran. If it's not what's going on in, in Iran, it's the whole, you know, issues that we're just dealing with domestically. There's so many things to be worried about. But I love that I'm a part of a church where there's some good news, where God is on the move. You know, if someone were to ask me, Keith, what do you love most about 242? Here's what I would not say. Would not say what I love the most is the fact that we have thousands of people every single week who call this their church home. I love that, but it's not what I love the most. I also wouldn't say I love the fact that we have hundreds of people around here every single week who take their next step with God. I love that, but it's not what I love most. Here's what I would tell you that I love most about 242 is I love the people here. I love the fact that I get to do life with people who are on mission for Jesus. I mean, when I think about Dave and Brad and Kevin and Joel and Jordan and Eric, and I can just keep on going through the list. I just love being on mission with folks like that. I feel like because of 242, I'm a better Husband, a better father, and a better Christ follower. Because here's what you should know if you're new around here. At 242, we don't just believe that we're a crowd that you come to on a weekend. But we believe that you're family. That we are a family and a community that you can plug into. You know, that's why I love what Jesus is doing with his family, with his disciples in John chapter 17. It's the last night of his life. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And he's going to make a shift in his messianic role. See, up until this point, they've seen Jesus as a healer and as a hero, but now he's going to act in the role of high priest. In John chapter 17, Jesus is going to pray what's been commonly known as the high priestly prayer. Here's why people call it the high priestly prayer. It's because he first prays for himself. He then prays for his disciples. Then he prays for us, his future disciples. See, under the Levitical code, on a day of atonement, the high priest would go into the holies of holies, the most sacred place, once a year. And before he did that, he would make a sacrifice first for himself, then the priestly class, then for the entire nation. 
It was a powerful moment. It was a moment where the whole nation realized something special was happening. Well, Jesus, he is both the high priest who offers prayers, but he becomes the sacrifice for the sins of the world. See, this had to be a moment for the disciples to see Jesus, who once they saw as the healer and the hero. I mean, they walked with Jesus. They saw him heal the sick and raise the dead. They even saw Jesus walk on water. I mean, can you imagine being with Jesus? You find yourself in the midst of an unexpected storm. See, I would assume some of you right now feel like you're in the midst of an unexpected storm. Maybe with your kids, maybe in your marriage, maybe some of you teenagers feel like you're in an unexpected storm of emotion. You feel anxiety, depression, rejection, whatever it is, you're in the midst of this unexpected storm. And in the middle of it, Jesus comes walking on the water. I mean, can you imagine what that was like? So he's walking on the water and then Peter, maybe impulsively, but, but courageously, he says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come walk on the water to you. And Jesus says, yes, it is I. Come. I can imagine Peter gets so excited that he tells the other disciples, it's Jesus. He said that it is him and I can come. The other disciple says, Peter, you're not listening correctly because there are so many uh, winds and waves and so forth. What he said is, no, stay in the boat. You are dumb. <laughs> but Peter boldly steps out and he starts to walk on the water. See, I believe the disciples would have saw Jesus as their hero because only Jesus can give you the power to walk on what threatened to destroy you. This storm, this storm that's overwhelming, that in one minute they're thinking, we're not going to survive. Now Peter is walking on the very thing that threatened to destroy him. But on this night, Jesus gathered with his disciples. He's going to pray this high priestly prayer. Here's what he says in John chapter 17, verse 23. He says, I in them and you in me, so that the people may be brought to complete unity. And then the world will know that you sent me, have loved them as you've loved me. Jesus prays for unity. He prays for one church. He doesn't pray for the Pentecostal church. He doesn't pray for the Methodist church, the Wesleyan church, the Baptist church. He prays for this one church. They would be unified. Now, I don't know about you, but if I could have been in that moment with Jesus and Jesus offered to just pray one prayer for me, like, I don't think I would have asked him to pray for something spiritual and profound. I mean, he's the second member in the Trinity. He's talking to God, the father. So whatever he prays, it's going to happen. I would probably have prayed or asked him to pray for something superficial. Like, I would have said, Jesus, if you can pray anything for me, please give me muscles like this guy right here. That would be awesome. Like, could you guys imagine if next, like, you know, today you see me like this and then next Sunday you saw me like that. Some of you would be like, wow, Jesus really answers prayers. I mean, that would be awesome. But in all seriousness, if I could have Jesus pray one prayer for me, I probably would ask him to pray for my kids. They would have peace. They have a perfect school year. Myself and my wife, like a lot of you, our kids started school last week and it was quite emotional. So now all four of our kids are in school. And, and so here's a picture of my first one, or, um, or this is my fourth one, Delaney. We took her to kindergarten this year and it was quite emotional. Like as we dropped her off with the teacher, there was this thing going through my mind like, hey, this is my most precious asset. So whatever you do, don't break her. But then there was this other feeling that rose up in me, a little bit of fear and defensiveness that I wanted to tell the teacher this. I didn't say that, but, but I had to start run through my mind. Listen, if anything happens to her, you need to understand that I have a very particular set of skills and I will come and find you. <laughs> but then we did that. And then Christian, he's in first grade this year. And then my son, Benjamin, he's in the fourth grade this year. And then finally, our daughter, Alana, she's in the sixth grade this year. That's what I would ask Jesus to pray for, that my kids would have a perfect school year. But here's my sneaky, my sneaky suspicion, is that Jesus wouldn't have prayed for any of that. Because here's a thought for you. Often the things that you want answers to prayer from, it is very possible that God has a different answer for you. So for some of us, what we're praying, we're saying, hey, God, give me this. If I only had this amount of money, I wouldn't have this problem. 
Oftentimes, God would say to you, here's the answer that I gave you is community, a family, a group of people that you could depend on that could be with you to walk through the challenges of life. He prays for unity. Now, this is the prayer he's going to pray on the Passover night. 50 days later, his prayer will be answered. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down. Peter gets up. He preaches the inaugural sermon of the church. 3,000 people come to faith. And look at the after effects. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to break in a bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the pe- believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. A church where people are devoted to God and devoted to prayer and devoted to one another. A church where generosity rules. A a, a church where people are glad and a church that is growing. But here's what happened. As a result of that growth, as a result of Jesus' prayer being answered, problems came to be. Look at this in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, that's a good thing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution food. That's a bad thing. So the church is growing. It's expanding. Lives are being changed. But yet problems come in the midst of this. See, here's what this proves to us. You've heard the saying that with great power comes great responsibility. What this proves to us is with great progress comes great problems. Now, all of us know this. Like, if your business starts to make huge progress, you go from having a small business to now having a big business, you now have bigger problems. You went from having $1,000 problems to now having million-dollar problems. You know this is, is true in your family. When you go from happily married to married with children, now you have bigger challenges and bigger issues. The question is, what do you do with those problems? For the disciples... They choose to look at it through God's perspective. For some of you, everything will change in your life when you start looking at your problems through God's perspective. See, instead of looking at this as a problem to be solved, they looked at it as an opportunity to be seized. See, there's so many times in our lives where we look at the problems in our life and we say, if I just didn't have this problem, if I just didn't have this situation, I would be okay Whereas God says, listen, I've got something totally different. This is actually an opportunity to be solved. Look, look, or opportunity to be seized. Look at what they do in, in, in verse two through four. It says, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together, said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them. We will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. The disciples say, okay, here's the thing. Our quality is starting to go down, but God is still moving. So instead of us being the heroes, we're gonna make heroes of other people. We're gonna give other people an opportunity to step up and step into what God is doing. And look at what happened as a result. In verse seven, it says this. So... The word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Three effects of this one decision. Did you know your decisions have consequences? Some of you are one decision away from the greatest breakthrough in your life, and some of you are one decision away from disaster. They make the decision to invest in others. Instead of burnout, they raise up other leaders. And number one, they grew wide. The church expanded. The message kept expanding. They kept reaching new people who needed to be in relationship with God. But then here's the second thing that happened. Is they grew in depth. See, there are some people who don't believe it's possible for a church to be wide and deep at the same time. 
They feel like it's kind of this dichotomy. Either you got to have depth or you got to have growth, but you can't have both, but not for the early church. The disciples understood that their mission was not just to go, but it was also to help people grow. She says, go in all the world and make disciples. Let me just tell you this. If you've been coming to 242 for a couple weeks, a couple months, you need to understand that we are passionate about the mission of reaching people for Jesus. But we're even more passionate about helping you to grow. See, around here, we use a process to help people grow called the nine. This is a picture of the nine. And for a lot of people, this is how they get started in their faith. If you're just new to coming to church, well, we'd say your next step is just keep coming back on a weekend. But we hope it doesn't stop there. We hope that there's a moment where you will hear the message of God, respond to it, and say, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus, and I'm going to express that through baptism. Every weekend this far, we've had somebody get baptized. You say, that's my next step. But then here's the next thing we want for you is we want you to start getting in the Bible. That's what we call daily encounter. From August to next August, our whole vision as a church is to help everybody on all seven of our campuses to get more in God's word. So starting next week, when you come in, we're starting this brand new series. We're going to give you a Bible reading plan because a lot of people that I meet will say, hey, pastor, I want to read the Bible, but I don't know where to start. So like I started in the book of Leviticus and I was like, whoa, that's a little too much. So we want to help you with that because here's the last thing that happened for this early church when they grew in width and in depth is they also grew in influence. Verse seven says a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. They started reaching people they never could reach before because they expanded their capacity. Let me just tell you why we're expanding in 2020. It's not because we need a bigger church. It's not because we want more challenges and more problems, but we believe God's going to give us an opportunity to reach people who we could never reach before. So as I end this message, I really want to end it with a question. And the question is this, what is your next step? 